Hi everyone, this is Jeff from the library and we are going to talk today about the APA 7th edition and how this will change how you put together your reference citations. Okay, so the differences between the APA 7th edition and APA 6th edition for reference citations. And a lot of times in this video, and you'll hear other people saying it like this too, when we talk about APA 7th edition or APA 6th edition, a lot of people will just say APA 7 or APA 6. So throughout this video, if you see me uh, refer to APA 7 or APA 6, what I'm talking about is APA 7th edition, which was just recently released, uh, compared to APA 6th edition. So that's what APA 7 and APA 6 means. Okay, <clears throat> APA 7 is mostly the same as the APA 6th edition guidelines. So that's nice. There are some significant changes, though. One of the biggest ones I noticed, uh, if a URL or permalink is subscription-based or password protected, don't include it in your citation. So for just about every library database, the databases are not free databases. Generally speaking, there's some kind of a subscription and there will be some kind of authentication built into the permalink or the URL. APA does not want to see a URL uh, or any kind of an online link in your citation unless it's completely open to everyone or unless it really uniformly identifies a source regardless of where you're at. And so subscription links are out and permalinks, you just don't include those anymore. Uh, for book citations, the city of the publisher is no longer required. So this is nice for book citations. You don't have to find the city of the publisher any longer, just the publisher name. Uh, for authors, it's a little different now. If there are more than 20 authors, use the dot 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 rule. And we'll talk about that later. Basically what that means is you list the first 19 authors, then a dot dot dot, and then the last author. Okay, no retrieved from statement required with citations to online sources. You used to have to put at the end uh, retrieved from, retrieved from this database, retrieved from this or that. You don't need that any longer. So overall, really I think that it's it's gotten simpler. Okay, let's talk first about library database article citations. This is especially uh, interesting to me since I'm a librarian. So this, this has changed probably more than anything in APA 7th edition. Okay, if a URL or permalink is subscription based or password protected, don't include it in your citation. This is going to include, this is going to include just about every URL or permalink from any type of a library database. A DOI is always preferred if there is a DOI. The DOI is a digital object identifier. It's kind of like an ISBN, but for an article. And uh, that is kind of a standard identifier for the article, regardless of where you are. For library database articles, list the DOI, not the URL or permalink. So if you can find a DOI, you list that since that's standard instead of the URL or permalink. If there is no DOI for a library database article, don't list the permalink or URL. Cite the article the same as if it were accessed in print. Here are some examples. So here's an article from an online database that does have a DOI. So there we have a standard citation here. Here's the authors, there's the year, there's the title. Notice only the first word of the title is capitalized. Then we get the journal title. Now this is tricky. This is the same as APA 6th edition, but so we list this in sentence, uh, sentence text, like uh, in a sentence only the first word would be capitalized unless we had uh, a proper noun in here. But here for the journal title, everything is capitalized. Okay, and that's in italics all the way up to the volume number. Then you get this DOI, and this is a standard DOI. You'll generally find those for peer-reviewed articles. You very rarely, if ever, we'll find them for a non-peer-reviewed article or a popular magazine article. Here's an article from an online database with no DOI. Okay, so we've got the citation. Look at that, no URL, no permalink, nothing. You cite it as if you were looking at it in print, which is kind of interesting. It certainly makes things simpler. And here's an article with no author listed. Sometimes you'll find those two. And there's no DOI in this one either. So here, if there's no author, you just start with the title. Then you give the year. This one had a very specific date, so you can add a more specific date in there as well. And then the journal, and then that. There's no, this is the page it was on. 
There's no, no URL, no permalink. Okay, what is a DOI? DOI is a digital object identifier. We talked about this earlier. It's sort of like an ISBN for an article. The DOI looks like this. So it looks kind of like a, like a URL. Here's an interesting thing a lot of people don't quite understand. Just because you have a DOI, that doesn't mean it provides full text access. Okay, the DOI is the preferred online locator to put in a citation because the DOI is generally not password protected and it generally brings up at least a reference to the article. But that doesn't mean you're going to get full text access to it. So you have to understand that I'm going to click on this on this DOI here. This took me to the publisher's website, which is great. And we found this article. So it's a standard locator for this article. But notice there's just an abstract there. And I would have to pay to access, access this. So the DOI is just, it just identifies the article. It, it does not give you full text access. Sometimes you might find it, but it does not guarantee any kind of full text access. The DOI is just to identify the article. It's just used to identify what it is. A lot of I see a lot of people posting things online and then being with the DOI and then saying, but that's the preferred locator. It is, but that doesn't mean it's going to automatically give any full text access. It's just to identify what the article is. Now, because of this, library databases like EBSCO will sometimes create customized DOIs to, to provide full text access. But those aren't the real DOIs. Those are not the standard DOIs. Let's take a look at this. So because this is such a tricky issue, this database here, EBSCO, this is a very well-known database, they create sometimes customized DOI. So I'm at CSU Global. So they've included our authentication information into this so that we can get full text access. But this is not the right DOI. You could put it in there and maybe, your, frankly, your instructor probably wouldn't catch it. But technically, that's not right to list that as the DOI. The DOI really, and that's nice that they put it in there. It's like a modified DOI, and you'll find those. Let's look at, let's go to the citation as the citation creator in EBSCO. Uh, cite, and then we'll look at the APA. This is the correct DOI. They did put the correct DOI in the citation, which is good. Notice there's no CSU Global in there. So again, this is the right DOI. Um, this is really nice and it does provide full text access, but that's not the actual standard DOI. Because if we just put this in online and you didn't have login information for our university, you wouldn't have access. So APA's basic philosophy behind this is <clears throat> they want uniform identifiers for everything as much as possible so that an identifier in a citation at one school means the same thing as it would at another school. Okay. What about resources from library video databases? So if the permalink or URL is subscription-based or password protected, don't list it in your reference. It's the same thing. And if it's, if it's a subscription <clears throat> library database, which just about all of them will be, it is going to have some kind of a password protection or authentication in the URL or permalink. So you don't list it. You do identify the video database you found the video in. You do put video in brackets with a period at the end after the title of the video. You italicize the title of the video. <clears throat> Here are some examples. So here <clears throat> is a video I found in Academic Video Online, which a lot of you might know as Alexander Street. Alexander Street publishes this. Um, so here are the directors. And if you can with a film, if you have that, that's, that's good to put that in there. Here's the year, here's the title in italics. After the title, I put video in brackets, period, and then the database that I found it in. No URL because it, it would be password protected and it wouldn't mean anything to someone at a different university. Here's one from a very popular library database, Films on Demand. Here, this is as a corporate author. I just put the corporate author in there, the year, title of the video, video, and it came from Films on Demand, the database. Here's one from LinkedIn Learning. This used to be called lynda.com. It was purchased last year by LinkedIn Learning. Here are the authors. 
I got a very specific date on this one. Here's the title. Now, I'm not sure if we mentioned this before, definitely in APA, in the title you only capitalize the first word until you get to a subtitle. When you get to the colon and the subtitle, you do capitalize the, the first word of the subtitle and you start over again. Here's the title, video, period, and then the database that I found it in. And the LinkedIn learning videos are password protected as well, so I don't list a URL. Okay, let's talk about the number of authors and the rules for citations. So as always, last name first, then first initial. If the author lists more than one initial, use more than one initial in your reference. Use commas between authors' names and an ampersand, that funny looking and right there, before the final author. And you will use a comma there as well. List all authors in your citations unless there are more than 20 authors. If there are 21 or more authors, you list the first 19 authors, then insert an ellipsis, the dot, 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 and then list the last listed author's name. And don't use an ampersand, that thing, in this situation. Let's take a look. Oh, and oh, also, don't include titles or ranks. This is a big question I get a lot. Uh, just because the person lists a PhD after their name, you, you don't include that in, in the reference. Okay, here are some examples. So here's an article with two authors. First author, last name, first initial, comma, and the ampersand, last name, comma, first initial, period. There's the year. Article with more than two authors. So we get the first author after the first, first name, initial, comma, next author, comma, next author, comma, ampersand, and. So you notice we have a comma. Even if there's just two, we have a comma before that ampersand always. Comma and last name, first initial, the year. Okay, and here is the dreaded article with more than 20 authors, which you will find these somewhat regularly if you're looking at peer-reviewed academic articles. There's a lot of authors sometimes in there. So we would list the first 19 authors, dot, 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 this isn't the 20th author. And this is for articles with 21 or more authors. So this is the 19th author here, dot, dot, dot. This is not the 20th author. This is the 30th author or whatever. This is the last author listed on the article. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 names, dot, 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 and then the last author listed. Notice no ampersand there. Okay, what about ebooks? <clears throat> if you're citing an ebook you found in a library database and it doesn't have a DOI, you basically cite it like a print book. And most ebooks don't have DOIs. Some of them will, very specific academic ebooks will. But very rarely will you find an ebook in an academic database that, that has a DOI. Just be prepared for that. If you find one, use it. But otherwise, you just don't use it. And you would not list anything at the end, just like those articles without a DOI. If you find the ebook in an open access database, go ahead and include the URL in the citation. Again, the basic rule is if that URL is standard and it will open up the same for everybody, list it. If there's any kind of password protection on it, you don't list it. And just about anything you find from a, a subscription-based library database, which is going to be most of the databases your library offers, those URLs and permalinks will be subscription-based, and so you shouldn't list them. This is the biggest change I know of from APA 6 to 7. Okay, so here's an ebook that I found in a library database. There's the author, there's the title, and there's the publisher. There's no city of publication, and there is no URL or DOI because there wasn't one. And the URL I could have used or permalink would have been subscription based. Here's an ebook accessed from a general website, not a library database. So this was an open access book that I found in Ahathi Trust Digital Library, which is an open access database. There's the author, there's the title, there's the publisher, and here it is where it's found online. And so since it's open access, this URL will behave the same for everyone. So you go ahead and list it at the end of your citation. <clears throat> How do I cite print books? How about if I'm just using a regular print book? 
you no longer has, have to list the city of the publisher is located in. So this is, <clears throat> this is a really nice thing that's really made things a lot simpler. If there's an editor instead of an author, which you'll find fairly regularly, include that with ED period or EDS period for multiple editors. Here's an example. So here's a book that I'm citing. There's the author, there's the year, here's the title, and there's the publisher. There's no no city of no city of uh, the publisher. It's really not necessary. Okay, here's a book with an editor instead of an author. So this this is a book with a bunch of chapters in it, um, and this is a this is the editor of the book who compiled it. So he's not the same as an author. Pretty similar. We have the author, and then ed period parenthesis and then another period right there. Here's another thing to notice. If you have it, you should list the edition of, of books uh, if you cite a book. And this is a kind of a little picky thing, but APA does not want the N and the D or the TH if it's fourth or fifth. They don't want that in superscript. They don't want those little things up here. They want them down here in regular, regular text. You might have to adjust your Word program to not autocorrect that. Okay, a book with multiple editors, you will find that it's just like authors. You've got the authors, EDS, period, period, and then the rest of it. Book with no author listed, you'll find that. You just start with the title. Again, no city of publication, no city of publisher there. Specific, uh, a book specific edition, we just covered that, but let's talk about that again. Here, normally your Word program would autocorrect that TH to be superscript up there in the air and little you would want to turn off if you want to make it correct that you probably won't get caught for that most people aren't going to notice it but technically APA you don't want you want this in regular text okay how about a chapter or section in an edited book here are the authors and this is this is the interesting thing this is the uh, these are the authors of this chapter this is the title of this chapter okay here's the authors here's the year of this chapter in this is the editor of this book radical cataloging essays at the front these this is the pages of this chapter page 40 to 52 there's the publisher so this is the editor of this book and notice when you list an editor in this situation you list these the way you're used to seeing them last name first initial last name first initial and um, also here when you go to the editor, when it's in, notice the editor, the first, the first initials are first and then the last name. So they reverse it in, in that case. So again, this is a little tricky. You're not citing the whole book. You're just citing a, sp a specific chapter in an edited book. So here are the authors of the chapter because you're not citing the whole thing. You just pulled information from this chapter. And this was found in... The editor is here, first initials first, instead of first initials last. ED, he's the editor, period, comma. Here is the title of the book that this chapter was found in. There are the pages it's on. And I notice I made a mistake in one of these other ones. Should be a comma right there. I'll need to go back and correct that. But you notice that even when there's two authors, there's a comma. So I make mistakes in this all the time, too. There should be a comma right there. Okay, how do I cite websites? These are the, the trickiest. These are the ones that are the, the trickiest for these standard types of citation styles. Here's the basic format. Okay, got author or authors in this case, date of publication, title of the web page, the name of the larger website that it comes from, and then the URL. So it's not that different from the other citations. Where it gets different is that a lot of times you don't have all these elements. Anyone who's tried to cite web pages knows pretty quickly they don't they don't follow the same kind of rules as books or database articles because they don't have to. Okay, so here's an here is uh, an example. Here's the author. I have a very specific date on these. Now, if you have a really specific date, you list the year first, comma, and then the date spelled out like that. That's how APA likes to see it. So I did have a very specific date for this article. Here is the title. This came from Time. This is Time Magazine Online. And here's the URL. 
So this was an easy one. Here's the author. Here's the date. Here's the specific article I'm looking at. But this specific article comes from a larger website, Time. So I list Time there. The title is in italics. Time is there. And then the URL, since that's an open access URL. Okay. Here's one that's a little bit different. This one the author is the National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse. The author is the organization. Okay, here's the date, and here is the title of the page I looked at, and here's, here's the URL. Now, I didn't list the larger website that it came from like I did here because the larger website is the same as the author itself. And I really like this about APA, that it doesn't want you to list information that you don't really need. We know it came from National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse. It really would be silly and not very productive and overly complicated to just list this again here. I think we can tell that this comes from the National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse. So if it's there, if it's already identified somewhere else in your citation, don't list the same information twice. So you can just leave that out here. I really like that APA has, is, is very practical like that. Okay, here's another example. This is United States Small Business Administration. They're the author, this corporate author. There's no date on this website. If there's no date, I put ND, parenthesis, period. So where I would put the year or the specific date, I just put ND with periods there. And a period at the end of the, of the parenthesis too. Here's the title of the web page. I'm not going to list the larger website it came from because it's the same as this. Those two things are the same. I, I don't have to list it twice. It would be counterproductive and it would just be rep rep repeating information you already have. Here's the URL, open access URL, so we list it. Okay, let's talk about dictionaries. So you found this dictionary online, dictionary.com. Now, this is a little different because a website like dictionary.com is updated pretty regularly. So the whole dictionary itself doesn't really have a date because it's always it's always being updated. So what you would do in a case like this is dictionary.com nd because there isn't really a fixed date for these. Okay, this was the term I looked up marketing. In kind of similar to the edited uh, the edited chapter in dictionary.com dictionary in italics, and then I put the retrieval date. I retrieved it on this day because it's understood that this gets updated a lot. I'm putting, I retrieved it on this day. This is when I got it. Generally, you don't need a retrieval date, but for something that's online that's going to change a lot, this isn't just a published article. This is going to change fairly regularly. Retrieved it here. Here's the open access URL. Very similar for an encyclopedia entry. It doesn't really have a date because the date is always changing. We have an actual author here. Here is the uh, title of the article in the larger work of Encyclopedia Britannica. I retrieved it on this date because this is going to change regularly. So it's a little, it's tricky for dictionary and encyclopedia citations. They're different, but they're similar enough to each other. They follow similar rules. And then there's the open access URL. Okay, how about Wikipedia? This is where it really gets tricky because as we all know, Wikipedia is updated very regularly, and it's not just updated by professional authors. It's updated by whoever has an interest and has access to the page. So there are a lot of, a lot of updates to it. So I think this is probably the most practical way to cite a Wikipedia page. Wikipedia citing a specific day you accessed the page. This would be my recommendation. Otherwise, you're going to have to track Well, we'll talk about it. Uh, so this is the name of the article I looked up, ND, because Wikipedia itself doesn't really have a date since it's always changing. So we put ND there in Wikipedia. The larger work, like Encyclopedia Britannica, is Wikipedia. And I retrieved it on this day. So if there's any question, because someone might go check your citation and find that this wording isn't there. But you can go in Wikipedia, you can track edits on it, which is really nice. And you could find what version was in effect at this date. And then you can you can look it up and you can see the old version of the page. And there is the, uh, this is just the general URL of, of that Wikipedia page. Now here's another way that they give advice for in 
in the APA manual, and I'm not sure how many people would really practically be doing this, but this is the same page, and this lists this date here. Now this date is the date of the edit was made, okay, in Wikipedia, and here's a specific link to that edit. To me, that's a lot more complicated than just citing it the regular way, and I think I think I made a mistake there. I think there should be a comma there. I'm, I apologize for my, my mistakes, but you can see even a person like me who's very familiar with APA, I make mistakes too. So I think that there should probably be a comma there. I really apologize for that error, but this is how it goes. There will be, <laughs> there will be errors and I am not perfect. Okay, what about YouTube and TED Talks? Okay, YouTube video, and I was right. There should have been a comma there on that last one. So. Just a regular YouTube video. Here's the author of uh, this YouTube video. Here's the date, very specific date. Here's the title. And then kind of like the library video database citation, you put video at the end in a bracket. To, uh, there's a period at the end of that bracket. You list YouTube, and then you list the URL for the video. So pretty easy and very similar, very similar to the library database citation, but since it's an open access URL, you go ahead and list that. TED Talk accessed on YouTube. Now this this is really interesting because TED Talk lists TED Talks are listed through YouTube or they're listed on the regular TED Talk web page, and uh, they are the citation styles are different, which seems a little strange, but that's that's the way that APA recommends it. So if you access a TED Talk on YouTube, you list TED here as the author. Here's the date, very specific date. Again, got to have that comma there, which I forgot in that earlier citation. Here is now, because it's accessed through YouTube, this is kind of strange. Ted is going to be listed as the author. And since the author is not really listed here, we do list the author here. And this probably would be in the title of the YouTube video anyway, but there's the author, colon, here's the title of the talk. Again, video period there, not there, here, YouTube, showing that we got it from YouTube, and there's the URL. It's a little, it's a little strange. Now, if you access the TED Talk from the TED Talk website, that's a little easier, I think. So you've got the author here, you've got the date, a little less specific of a date, but this is the date they listed. Here's the title, video, period at the end of the bracket, and then you list the larger website as TED conferences, and then the URL. So it's it's a lot more like just citing a general website. So I probably, if I had the choice, I would do this because it's it's a little simpler. But you can certainly do it this way too. Just use that guidance for it. Okay, social media and podcasts. This is where it gets really tricky. So APA seven is very realistic realistic about the world we live in and it knows people will want to cite social media as well as podcasts or things like that that it didn't in, didn't talk about in their earlier editions. So here's a Facebook post. There's the author. There's the date. There's the title of the post. It's from Facebook and then there's a link to it. Okay, how about Twitter? There's a Twitter tweet. Here's the author. There's that. <laughs> the how you would identify them on Twitter. Here's the date. There's the title. It's a tweet. So kind of like earlier when we did the video, we put this in brackets, a tweet. It's from Twitter. And then you list the uh, the uh, URL that anyone could get into. Okay, podcast episode. So I'm looking at the Joe Rogan podcast here. Joe Rogan Experience. So here's, for a podcast episode, <clears throat> I'm putting Joe Rogan first, and then I'm identifying host here. Here's the date. Here's the here's the title of the episode. This is the person who was interviewed. And on this one, they listed there an identifier for what which episode it was. So I listed that as well. Audio podcast episode. You could put video there as well. But I just put audio podcast episode in brackets, kind of like we did with tweet or with video. You just identify what it is. And then in in parentheses, or I'm sorry, in italics, the Joe Rogan experience. And then there is a link directly to that episode. Okay, 
how about newspaper articles? Okay, so if you're if you're citing it from an article that you read in print, uh, this is it's really the same as it's always been. There's the author, there's the date, here's the title, and this is in the Daily Camera. And then in parentheses, I list the city because it's not clear from the Daily Camera, although that is Boulder, Colorado's newspaper. It's not clear from that. From I know the Daily Camera is there because I live near Boulder, but a person in New Jersey isn't going to know what the Daily Camera is. So in a case like this, Daily Camera, Boulder, Colorado, this is the page that it's on. Okay, it's probably more likely that you're going to be citing a newspaper article that you found online. So it's similar, but it's a little bit different. Here's the author, there's the date, here's the title of the article, and you see it, it's really very similar. And Daily Camera, again, I'm pulling from the same newspaper again. I show what city it's in since the average reader may not know that. And then here's a link into that article. And that's an open access link. There's no password protection on that, so I can list it. Okay, here's, an, here's another example. Newspaper article where the city is clearly identified in the newspaper title. So here we go, here's the author, date, title, the Denver Post. I don't have to put Denver, Colorado because the Denver Post is there. So it's pretty clearly understood from that that this is, this is from the Denver Post from Denver, Colorado. I know there's other Denvers out there, so maybe people could debate that. But generally speaking, if the city is in the title and it's pretty clear what it is, uh, you don't need to list the city and state. Okay, so here is the link open access link into that article okay here's a film and this is not not i didn't necessarily find this online but i could have the nice thing about apa 7 for the rules for films there's so many different ways you could access a film you don't have to list whether you watched it on video or on netflix or on a VHS or a DVD or whatever, or you saw it in a movie theater, you just cite the film, which I'm really glad that you don't have to cite all those things because it really doesn't matter where you watched it. Okay, here's the director. Now I'm listing him in the place of an author because a director is usually about as close as you can get to an author with a film, but you could list someone else here too. If you wanted to list the screenwriter, if you were citing primarily the written dialogue of the film, you could put the screenwriter and put screenwriter here, but I'm just citing the film as a whole. So he's the closest here to the direct to the author. Put him in his and identify who this person is. Director, 1971. Here's the name of the film, and then at the end it says film. Period, and who published the film? Okay, I think that's all the examples I have for you. Uh, oh no, we have one more. Oh, so tricky. Interviews. Okay, this is how you would cite a standard published interview that you would find online somewhere. <clears throat> Here's the author. This was the interviewer. This is the person conducting the interview, writing the story. Here's the date of it. Here is the title of the interview. Elon Musk on his success, America is the land of opportunity. There's no other country where I could have done this. Okay, there's the title. It's from CNBC. And then here is the URL to it. Okay, so this in a standard interview, this is the interviewer, and you might generally you'll have the interviewee named in the title, and you might want to add that if it if it isn't clear. But there's the interviewer. Here's the person being interviewed. Here's the title of the interview. This is the larger website it's found on, and then there's the URL. Okay, now question that comes up a lot is what if I conducted a personal interview? I've been I've been doing original research for this paper, which is great. That's great. However, let's read this here. Don't list a citation in your references list for this type of interview because no one else can access the interview. Only cite the interview parenthetically in your paper. You would parenthetically cite a personal interview like this. So you don't list a reference at all in your reference list to a personal interview. APA's new rules are that they really don't want something listed that not everyone can access. Uh, or they want you to list, if there is something that some people have access to and other people don't, you, you just list it. You don't put anything in there that people can't actually go and look at. Now, with this personal interview, you probably have it saved on your computer or saved on your phone or you have your notes written up, but other people aren't going to have access to those notes unless you've published it somewhere. And if you publish it somewhere with open access, maybe you could reference it. But generally speaking, you're not going to do that. So 
as strange as it is, you don't list a reference to that in your citation list at all. You just cite it parenthetically. So this would be how you would cite it parenthetically. It seems a little strange, but this is this is how you would cite it. Okay, I think that's all the that's all the examples I have for you. Yeah, that's it. So there are many more examples we could have shown here, or I could have shown here, but this is hopefully to get you started and show you some of the main differences between APA 6 and APA 7. If you have any questions, as always, get in touch with me and I'll help you any way that I can.